Monaco, where the rich and famous come out to play. This week hosting the richest poker tour on the planet, the Poker Stars and Monte Carlo Casino EPT Grand Final. Game day today. Monte Carlo, let's go. <laughs> Players from far and wide have descended on this glamorous location with one thing on their minds. For me, there's no better place in the world than Monaco to play poker. It's a combination of a great vacation, as well as a chance to win a whole bunch of euro. Definitely everybody that comes here wants to win it, and it's special. It's, it's the grand final for a reason. It's what every player strives for. It's the trophy every player wants to win. It's the climax of EPT8. This is the setting for one of the most stunning events in the poker calendar, an event that attracts pros and amateurs alike. The EPT Grand Final is one of the world's biggest tournaments, and this year, it's back in its original home, Monaco. The main event kicked off yesterday with 271 players signing up on day 1A. Today has drawn a bigger field, 394 runners, bringing the total number to 665. It's not just the location that's tempted the world's best, it's the chance to be crowned EPT Grand Final Champion. Each player's bought in for 10,000 euros, meaning there's 6.6 .6 million in the prize pool. And it means first prize stands at a colossal 1.5 million euros. So the EPT Grand Final's back where it belongs, the land of luxury yachts, expensive sports cars and high stakes gambling. Yes, Monaco is for ballers and we've got a few at our feature table. Both Faraz Jacka and Jonathan Duhamel have had phenomenal starts to 2012. With Jacka finishing third at the PCA and Duhamel final tabling four out of five events in the Bahamas. But one thing eludes them, an EPT title. And a player who knows how it feels to lift that trophy is Russia's Maxim Likov. It's a lot of good players, but I will try to make uh, huge prizes. I have ambition to be the best poker player in Russia and also in the whole world. And there's bound to be plenty of action out in the field with 394 players from all over the globe and from all walks of life here to stake their claim on the final EPT title of Season 8. What started in Tallinn concludes in Monaco, the 13th and final stop on the tour. I can't believe season eight is almost over. James, will you sign my yearbook? For a moment there, I thought you were gonna ask me to sign your chest. Okay, that works. Poor Jonathan went out of the super high roller yesterday in seventh place, making him the biggest bubble boy in EPT history. I don't wanna say the helicopter ride from France to Monaco is scary, but yesterday Faraz's hair was actually straight. Man, how awesome would it be if Maxim Likov's middle name was Mum? <laughs> Every player starts the EPT Grand Final with a stack of 30,000, and after the first couple of levels, for most players there's not been too much movement, except for Jonathan Duhamel, who somehow lost two-thirds of his starting stack. Well, after being the massive bubble boy yesterday, it's understandable if he's not playing today at his full capacity. Line's currently 100-200. Action will be on for Raz Jacka. will fold the 9-3. Passed around to Jonathan Duhamel. He raises. 450. Makes it 450 total. Max Likov. 10-7 off, will call from the cutoff. Max getting a little frisky here. A lot of times players won't come alive until antis are involved. Emin Agaev has pocket fives, calls from the button. And Mesbar Gerfi will call from the big blind. Gerfi getting some nice pot odds in the big blind. Five, jack, seven. A set for Agaev. Gerfi flops up and down, but he's not the original razor, playing in flow. Duhamel was the razor. Will he continue? No, he checks. He missed about as hard as you can miss a flop. Likov's got a pair of sevens. He bets 1,100. Taking a stab at this. 
The guy makes the call. I'd expect him to bomb it there. I think he's probably supposed to raise. It's a pretty wet board and lots of players are involved in this hand. Gaffey is chasing a straight. Duhamel gets out of the way. gaffey has been given great odds to stick around. The turn card is another jack. A guy of improves to a full house. Well, there's a guy of gin card, so I mean, great job not raising. Wee! It's been checked to a guy of. Two fights. 2,500. Don't know if we'll get much action now. It's pretty easy for either of these guys to be drawing dead, especially Max. Gaffey folds. Likov can still win the hand with a seven or jack on the river. He is drawing dead to even a single jack right now, though. He calls. Four of hearts on the river. Gurfey would have made it straight. He's going to be a little ticked if this doesn't get to showdown. The guy I should definitely bet for value. Pretty slim shot he gets called, though. Six. Six thousand. Usually breaking out the 5k chips this early means bidness. Don't be a hero, Max. He lets it go. Definitely don't need heroes this early in the tournament. First of all, they're so much less likely to be messing around this early. Second of all, each of these pots is less important this early. Third of all, your mom. I don't know. That's all I had. From an EPT champion on our feature table to two more champions on our secondary feature table, Frenchman Elki and Christoph Benzimra. Look at Elki slumming it in the 10k Euro event. Finished third in the super high roller last night. Check, check on the turn. Deuce of hearts on the river. Potential wheel out there now, but the flush draw missed. Elki checks again. Then Zimra checks behind. Elki shows six nine of clubs. Top pair in a flush draw versus second pair in a straight draw. How'd that pot stay so small? Guys played it pretty passively. Also at this table is Bruno Lopez, a major figure in French rap. And if you don't think French rap is hardcore, that guy's only 26. Tom Marchese is listening to Cool Shen right now. Did I say Cool Shen? I meant to say Cool in the Gang. Celebrate good times, eh, buddy? Come on. <laughs> on the outer tables, two more EPT champions. Vicky Corrin facing a raise from Vladimir Geshkinbein. Vicky beat Melanie Weiser in a 5k heads-up event last oh. night, and the coolest part about that is that it wasn't even a ladies' event. Good on you, ladies. Vicky, three bets right. to 1,200. Yes, and taking a stand. Okay. And protecting the no chips I'd put in the pot already. I would hope she's at least got some kind of hand to be doing this at this point. You know me, you should know I'm, I don't like to fall, so... It's okay, I've identified you as the soft target on the table, and I'm gonna try and play as many pots with you as possible. You know I'm joking, right? I'm almost 100% sure Vicky has no idea who he is, but it's true, he does not like to fold. Pretty dry flop. Vladimir Gesh combined checks, Vicky continues for 2,000. Really didn't hit much of Vicky's three betting range at all, though she could very well have the best hand. Cool. Gesh combined calls. <coughs> five of clubs on the turn, Gesh combined checks a second time. That makes things a bit sloppier out there. The five made one gut shot and put a few more flush and straight draws out there. See if Vicky keeps barreling. Nope, she checks behind. The third club on the river, the Jack of Clubs. Gesh combined checks a third time. He's played this pretty passively. Still don't think his board hits much of Vicky's range at all. She bets 3,000. Lad might be thinking that very same thing. Check raise alert. Why would you raise now? I'll tell you. One, he backdoored a flush or turned a straight. Or two, he's bluffing. He knows you can't call, so he's bluffing the pants off you, which, Vicky, as a woman, I believe you're perfectly entitled to wear if you like. Vicky being railed by her fiance, okay. comedian David Mitchell. I didn't oh, recognize him without him talking directly into the camera. You know what, though? People are sort of never bluffing there, are they? The number of times I've called these check raises on the river, and they're sort of. It's like they're never bluffing. I think they're only bluffing when you fall. Yeah, <laughs> Another female player in the field is Annette Oberstad. She's called the all-in of Olivia Busquet. He's way ahead, but he is at risk. Aya! And there's a jack on the flop. Brutal flop for Busquet. He's taking it well. He is dead to a queen. Two outs for Olivier. He doesn't get there. Incredibly unlucky. More like Olivier Busto. 
Well, after winning Olivier's chips, and at Oberstad will have one of the five biggest stacks in the room. Well, let's stay with the ladies, shall we? Yes. Hardigan, where's my phone? Liv's probably texting me. No, I think she's probably texting her boyfriend, Kevin McPhee. Oh. Well then, well then, who's sending me these texts about an EPT winner having a big crush on me? There's your answer. Ah, oh, Jason, man, I told you, you're just not my type. Wait, aren't you in a relationship with Daniel on Facebook? It's complicated. I wake up in the morning brushing my teeth in there. Why do I go through me? They will, they will. When you make the final. Eh, even then, probably not. It's a confirmation that Annette Oberstad is currently third in chips. Bear in mind, it's very early days. Current tournament chip leader is Team Pro's Max Martinez. And second on the leaderboard is Justin Bonomo, who of course won that super high roller trophy last night. He's brought it to the table. Maybe he's going to use it as a card protector. I thought wearing a WSOP bracelet at the table was cheesy. Back to our feature table. Action on for us, Jucka. Pocket jacks. Raise. Raise it up to 500. James, don't you mean pocket jackas? Fold. Oh, the old ones are the oldest. <laughs> Passed around to Maxim Likov. Jack nine suited, and he three bets the button, makes it 1425 total. This is a little unorthodox. Max is wrapping a pretty big hand to be three betting an under the gun razor, although Faraz does tend to open wider than an airplane hanger. No way he's laying down jacks, though. He calls. And we go heads up to the flop. Leak off in position and with the betting lead. Jack is over pair still good. Leakoff has paired his nine. Yeah, unfortunately for Max, he might like this flop. Goes check, check on the flop. Opts to take a free turn card. Jacka checks again. Pretty surprised to not see Faraz bet there with an over pair to the board. There's no real reason for Max to bet. Ten of clubs on the river. Max is very likely in cheap showdown mode. 10 changes absolutely nothing about this hand. Jacka decides to value bet the river, 2,300. Might look like a thin value bet, but Max has really not played this hand at all like he made top pair. He calls. Jacka shows the jacks. And Leakov mucks. He mucks after sharing Faraz's helicopter, only this time it was from Monaco to Value Town. Faraz near enough his starting stack, just over 28,000. Similar size stack for Max Leakov. Tag your tweet, EPT Grand Final. It's day 1B of the Poker Stars and Monte Carlo Casino EPT Grand Final. This year, the tournament has drawn a total of 665 players. Now, yesterday was day 1A. 271 players signed up. And amongst the group of 165 that made it through the day were 2009 world champion Joe Carter, 2010 grand final winner Nicholas Schwiti, EPT8 player of the year contender Andre Vinklarek, and a few poker superstars, including Vanessa Selbst and, wait for it, Phil Ivey. We'll see them back here on day two. Phil Ivey is going to be here on day two. Man, I feel like that general guy when he found out the Emperor was going to be visiting the Death Star. Phil Ivey is terrifying. I think you mean Moff Jarrod, played by British actor Michael Pennington. Are you kidding me? My God. Do something with your life. Says the man who spends most of his waking hours writing poker puns. <laughs> Action's been folded around to the Italian player Cristiano Guerra. Queen Jack in the hijack raises to 450. Max Leakov with A6 suited. Or three bet, as is his style. Makes it 12.50 total. This hand isn't a mandatory call or re-raise from the cutoff, but this is fine. You just have to tread lightly if you make top pair. Being dominated is wicked embarrassing. Both blinds fold. Action's back on Guerra. He makes the call. The call's a little loose, but we know Max has been three betting just about every hand. That's a pretty nice flop for the Italian. Not bad at all. Checks to the razor. Setting the tarp. Nikov will continue. 15. 1500. 
Gara could raise, but it'd likely chase off his action. A smooth call may induce Max to keep firing away at this. He calls. Well, he already had a lock on the hand. He improves to a full house on the turn. Nice to go from the virtual nuts to the actual nuts. Checks a second time. Continues with his trap. At this point, he can only be sucked out on by a set of jacks catching the case jack on the river. Likov slowed down. He checked behind. Garrett checks again. One more shot at the trap. Kind of like when the Enterprise pretended to be incapacitated at the end of Wrath of Khan. So to three. What did you say about getting a life? Likov will bluff at it. Makes it 3,300. Yeah, well, this is just like in the movie. Khan's all approaching the Enterprise without even putting his shields up. And all of a sudden, Kirk's all... Fire! Raises to 10,200. Insta-folded by Likov. Nice job by Gera, especially if he went into the hand knowing Max's rep. A rep that is very likely suffering at this point. Likov now down to 22,000. Heading over to our secondary feature table where Tom Marchese is playing post-flop against a man who was born to be a Bond villain, Darko Stojanovic. Marchese started this hand under the gun, so he is out of position. Marchese. We'll bet. 1,400. Stojanovic will raise all in. Tom's only got 10,850 behind, so his is the effective stack. He's going to need something pretty decent to justify making this call. He folds, and Stojanovic shows a 10. Looks like Tom's decision was more frustrating than it was difficult. Looks like Kevin McPhee's involved in a leveling war with Jason Mercier. A five bet pot, 7,700 in the middle already. A 10-5 deuce flop with two spades. With these two jokers clowning around, neither one of them has to have a hand, though I will say the fact they're both playing from middle position makes it a little more likely. Check, check. Surprised to see it go check, check in a three bet pot. Six of diamonds on the turn. McPhee checks again. One of these guys has eventually got to take a stab at it. Jason checks behind. King of hearts on the river. Jason staring at the board. Kevin staring at Jason. Check, check again. What is going on here? Ace queen for Jason Mercier. Ace king for Kevin McPhee. He was ahead on every street. Explains all the checking. It's day one. You're playing deep with another one of the best players in the world. No reason to get too crazy. Both these guys had hands that could win at showdown. They were both playing as bluff catchers. Both Jason and Kevin have similar stacks. Let's stay on the outer tables and check in on Kevin's other half, Liv Bury. Involved in a hand against Flavius Puica. Puica was the original razor and he's in position. Liv has three bet to 850. Puica makes the call. We go to the flop. It's a wheelie flop. Wheelie exciting. Check, check. More checking. Six of diamonds on the turn. My guess is that if Puika had an ace, he would have bet the flop. He bets 1,100 on the turn. Liv calls. We go to the river. Liv just doesn't believe this guy, and I don't either. Nine of spades on the river. Puika now checks. This fellow's telling me and Liv that he ain't got an ace. This might be all the incentive she needs to bet. She does bet. 2,100. Puika looks her up. Liv shows ace nine. She rivered two pair. Puika's body language and little head shake here is telling me he got sucked out on at some point in this hand. My guess is something somewhere between tens and kings. Liv now playing more than 32,000. We've got a couple of super high rollers here. Daniel Negrano and Anatoly Gertovoy. This hand actually went three ways to the flop. The other player already folded. Daniel check called the flop for a thousand. He checks the turn. Puts a flush draw out there. Wheel draw as well. Pretty unlikely that card affected either player. Gertavoy bets again. 2,500. Gertavoy's raised and fired on two streets now. Looks like at least top pair to me. Daniel calls. No idea what Daniel would be calling with. Maybe a nine or a seven. King of spades. Daniel likes to mess around a lot with connectors and gappers in that range. Went check check on the river. Gertavoy shows ace nine and Daniel mucks. Top, top players are going to value bet ace-nine there a lot of the time, but most aren't really capable. Too worried about that king hitting the river. 
Lucky for Daniel, he got a free showdown at least. I'll say one thing about Daniel, he knows how to accessorize. Like, he, he knows how, not that he's any good at it, he just knows how to do it. Two chains, two earrings, I bet he's even got toe rings. Let's head back to our feature table. When Jonathan Duhamel will be first to speak, he's under the gun, Jack-9 suited, raises to 450. A tad loose under the gun. Likov with ace-king. I'd say if this were suited, we'd definitely see a re-raise. Unsuited, still fairly likely, especially given that it's Max Likov and he three bets everything. Pumps it up to 13.25. Our guy has having to think. He'll fold. Richard Lindaker, nine six of diamonds. Come on, quit eating up camera time. We need to save that time in case Daniel gets a massage. Whereas Jack has folded the button. Both blinds fold. We're back on Duhamel. Max's three bet of an under the gun razor is going to look pretty strong, especially since he's in fairly early position himself and had lots of action still to go behind him. Jonathan folds. Tough to play that hand out of position. Jonathan bubbled the super high roller yesterday, and at this rate, he's not even going to make it out of day one of this event. The aggressive Russian is below average in chips, but still has a very playable stack as he competes for his second EPT title here in Monaco. Победа в турнире ЕПТ Киев шестого сезона значила для меня очень много, потому что это был, в принципе, мой первый турнир ЕПТ, который я играл. Это было достаточно серьезное событие в России, которое дало возможность молодым игрокам почувствовать, что можно выигрывать турниры за рубежом, даже в Киеве. Победа на ЕПТ изменила мою жизнь, но не сильно. В основном я вложил все деньги в банкролл, продолжил играть и сделал покупку в виде машины. Когда я был очень близко ко второму титулу, это было в сан и в Сноуфесте, я волновался, конечно, больше обычного, потому что победа давала мне Открывал двери совсем на другие лимиты и другие желания, но, к сожалению, пока не получилось, и я буду стараться в дальнейшем завоевать второй титул. Для меня лично и для любого профессионального игрока это очень престижно выиграть турнир Гранд Финал, потому что он заключительный во всей серии турниров ЕПТ, и это огромные призовые, которые даст любому игроку свободнее в покере в дальнейшем. Guy just wants to win so he can play higher limits of poker. What a sicko. Buy something. Have to say that Kiev final was probably one of my favorite EPT final tables of all time. Loved watching Likov play. Oh, it had nothing to do with the buffet spread? It definitely had nothing to do with the undercooked pizza and cold borscht. Sorry, I missed it. Cristiano Guerra has 6-5 suited under the gun. He raises to 450. Pocket fours for Likov. Just calls. Finally. Richard Lindaker has ace-king. This is probably a spot for a three bet. See if he can't make sure this pot doesn't go six ways to the flop. He'll raise it to 1625. Baraz Jacker. Thinking about doing something with Ace Three. Oh boy, I was wondering when Faraz Jaka was going to get here. He four bets to three thousand nine hundred. Faraz has just opened up a can of Jaka on these guys. He's deep enough to do this, and cold four betting is going to look super strong. Even though there is an Ace out there, having an Ace blocker means it's less likely one of them has a big Ace. Actions on the original Razor. Don't even bother, pal. Gera Mux. Likov. He'll get out of the way. Now, what does Lindaker do? Now, if Lindaker knows anything about Jaka's game, he knows there's a pretty good chance this four bet is baloney. But when you're stacked this deep, it's so, so hard to commit 30k to winning 7k in the pot pre flop, even against a known psychopath. Still, I love Faraz and all, but I kind of want Lindaker to take this ace king and shove it right up his Jaka. 
I don't like calling because if you miss, Faraz is going to eat your lunch. There's absolutely no shame in folding at this stage of the tournament. And that is what Lindaker will do. He got jockered, y'all. And it looks like he knows it, too. Faraz Jock is so sick, he might actually be the cause of the zombie apocalypse. I might have to start calling him Patient Zero. A well-timed cold four bet by Faraz. To find out how you can join us on the European Poker Tour, featuring the show, and when training from a top poker pro, go to PokerStars.com. Welcome back to the PokerStars and Monte Carlo Casino EPT Grand Final. We're a few levels into play here on Day 1B, so everyone's finding their feet, getting comfortable, and readying themselves for the long haul. Justin Bonomo is continuing his amazing run, having just won the Super High Roller Tournament for an impressive 1.6 million. He's currently second in chips, with Italian Team Pro Max Martinez setting the pace. For others, the main event hasn't gone to plan. PCA champions John DiBella and Alexi Bilicur, along with Magic the Gathering Specialist and Team Pro David Williams, have already bitten the dust. Ooh, they should add a Magic the Gathering tournament to this event next year. Guaranteed it gets a better turnout than Limit Hold'em. It's a new level. The blinds stay at 100-200. We introduce a running ante of 25. Action folded around to Faraz Jaka. Ace, eight of spades in the cutoff. He raises to 500. With the antis involved, now's when the real poker starts. What's going on here? Olivier Deuce will call from the button. Even though Faraz is a maniac, doesn't mean you should be calling with hands like this, even in position. That's a definite fold. Duhamel will call from the big blind with 7-6 off. Duhamel is getting better than 5-1. to one. His call's fine. Well, it's a king high flop. Deuce takes the lead. Deuce hits pretty much the best flop he could hope for. Duhamel has checked. Faraz continues at 800. Calling here is definitely the play. Folding's inane and raising would only get you action from better. Deuce does call. Duhamel will fold. Let's see if Faraz knows to slow down now that he's been flatted on the flop. The turn is another deuce, which means deuce is still in front. This is getting confusing. Jucker now checks. It's a perfect opportunity for Deuce to start betting for value. What the deuce? He checked behind. Oh boy. Four hearts on the river. Faraz checks again. Deuce checks again. No, what are you doing? Are you kidding me? He played that hand like a real deuce. He got more streets wrong than a blind postman. Well, Faraz lost that one, but we saw him win a pot earlier on with a bold bluff. There was a raise to 450 from Cristiano Guerra and a call from Max Likov. American player Richard Lindaker woke up with Ace King. He three bet to 1625, only for Faraz to four bet to 3900 with Ace three off. Guerra and Likov get out of the way. It was then back on Lindaker. Now Ace King is a tricky proposition this early in the tournament, but against an aggressive opponent in Faraz Jaka, we asked some familiar faces on the EPT circuit what they would do. Let's say I have ace-king and someone raises to 450. I got about 30,000 stack. Um, I would most likely re-raise him in position. I think flat calling pre-flop is also fine when you're playing this deep. And if it gets cold for a bit, so if a third player uh, decides to get involved and re-re-raises you, yeah, then it gets really tricky. So I would definitely three-bet as well. And then when Faraz four-bets, I mean, it's Faraz Jaka, so <laughs> let's be honest, he could have anything because it kind of looks like a good spot for me to three bet, but then again, I have to remember that there is no Annie's yet, and me and Faraz both are over 100 big blinds deep, so even though it's Faraz, you definitely have to be a little bit weary that he might actually have a big hand. Well, if I'm in this hand and it's early in the day, uh, on day one, I would probably lean towards just calling. Maybe later in the tournament, I might re-raise and get it all in, but early on, I'm gonna try and see a flop, see if I flop an ace or a king and proceed cautiously. I would say in most tournaments, you still have so many soft spots that I would 
I, I like tree wedding. I like calling pre-flop, but I don't think I would, I would want to get it in before the flop. You know, I'm I'm not afraid of having to uh, play three streets post with Faraz, and if I have to call him down with Ace King High, I might just do that. But I think it's uh, we're so deep that it's one of those spots where I think I'd just rather play post flop and see what develops. You know, it's weird. I wouldn't even consider calling as an option, but that's because I'm absolutely terrified of Faraz. On the outer tables, tennis legend Boris Becker is all in. And he is in trouble. Pasquale Vinci has a straight. Boris needs the board to pair. It doesn't. We lose Bebex. Vanny, Vidi, Vinci. That's a call. Look at that pose. So stoic. Like a painting. Whatever, no bigs. Ten bucks says Bebex is sunbathing on a yacht within the hour. I know because I saw him reserve a deck chair with a towel about five o'clock this morning. We've lost another player from the tournament, our most recent EPT champion, Davidi Katai, KO'd by Chris Moneymaker. Just remember, Davidi, Monaco may have a prince, but he doesn't have the triple crown. After winning that part, Chris Moneymaker will be playing a stack of just over 33K. This guy's name is Moneymaker? Oh my God, is that for real? It's hilarious. Nice to see you recycling material from 2003. Martin Finger is the current tournament chip leader. He won Prague this season. I understand Martin is a guy who doesn't pull any punches. He's out in front with a stack of 90,000. Max Martinez, Justin Bonomo, and Annette Oberstad still in the top five. And remember, these are still early days. Well, it's the earliest day. It's day one. Bonomo in action again. This man, he has half my chips already. Bonomo's a Terminator. He won't stop till he gets them all. Ah, uh, you're too good, Justin. I pulled you. But Tozzi gets out of the way. Decision now on Goryachev. He folds as well. Nice, man. Show me two hearts. Come on. Can't do it. I did not have two hearts. I bought you a bottle of water when this game started, my friend. <laughs> How can I show you two hearts? I don't have two hearts. I'm telling you the truth. This time I believe him. People say Justin plays like a cold, emotionless robot. I don't know if that's true, but I know he did just add that smile program today. Back to our secondary feature table. It's Tom Marchese versus Christoph Benzimra, who won EPT Warsaw back in season six. King nine, deuce eight board. Flush and straight draws out there. Actions on Benzimra. And he will bet 2,500. Seems like Marchese wants to stay involved, but he's hesitating for some reason. Man, I really wish that audience this way sign said, I'm with stupid. Marchese has about 12,000 behind. Looks back at his cards. He's got some kind of difficult decision here. He shoves. After all that hemming and hawing, it doesn't really look like Marchese loves his hand. Benzimra calls. Showdown. Marchese has got pocket aces. Benzimra turned two pair. Okay, maybe he loved it, but he wasn't in love with it. But a nine on the river sees Marchese improve to a better two pair. Benzimra got counterfeited so bad, I'm wondering if the dealer's related to Frank Abagnale. Marchese gets lucky. He doubles up and survives. Well, he got unlucky on the turn, lucky on the river. Tom's got lifetime tournament winnings of more than 2.5 million. 2010 really was the year of the Marchese. That was the year he was named Card Player's Player of the Year. He won an NAPT title, and he made the final table of the High Roller Tournament here in Monaco. I played Monaco two years ago, the last time it was here, and I think I busted the main event on day one, but I was fortunate enough to get fourth in the High Roller, so. It was a profitable trip, and honestly, it's pretty convenient when you win a bunch of money in Monaco because you're definitely going to spend a ton of money. I don't want to say Monaco's expensive, but the bus drivers count the fares using a jeweler's loop. Back to our main feature table. Emin Agaev is under the gun. And he will fold. As does Richard Lindaker. Raising. Mesbar Gaffey's raising with King Queen. Makes it 500 total. 
King Queen's a hand that could end up dominated, but it's fine to raise with it. Jonathan Duhamel. That's 9-10 suited on the button, he calls. Fine call on the button. King Jack for Cristiano Guerra. He folds. Likov in the big blind with sixes will call. Easy defend from the big blind. Three-way to the flop. And that flop gives Jonathan top two. Big flop for Jonathan. Likov checks. Gurfi checks as well. He does not continue. Gurfi gives up the lead. He does have a gut shot to the nuts. Jonathan checks behind. Seven of clubs on the turn. The board had some straight draws to protect against, but with two checks in front of him, Jonathan might not have wanted to chase his action away. Now Likov comes out betting. 900. He's got a gut shot now, too. His hand could easily be the best one. Normally, this would be a pretty good spot to take a stab at it. Gurfi has folded his straight draw. Time for Jonathan to get some more money in there. 24. Raises to 2,400. He wants to make max pay before another straight card can hit. Clubs are probably a factor as well. And Likov quickly folds. So Dumel wins a small pot. Just can't get his stack up above 11,000. Are you feeling his pain? Let us know and tag it. EPT Grand Final. Welcome back to the Poker Stars and Monte Carlo Casino EPT Grand Final. Now, Monaco is renowned for having a ludicrous number of millionaires. And this week, a new member of the club will be admitted. The winner of this tournament will pocket a cool 1.5 million euros. But there's still a long way to go. Being a millionaire in Monaco is like being blonde-haired and blue-eyed in Sweden. It's nice and all, but nobody gives two deuces. Blind still 100, 200 with a 25 ante. Action has been folded around to Jonathan Duhamel. 450. A min plus raise with 9 4 of clubs. Okay, yeah, he's in position, but this is pretty loose. Gets Garrett to fold, ace 8 suited. Likov gets out of the way. Gaev has a 6 and will defend his big blind. This is a hand I'm wary about defending with, but obviously he's ahead of Jonathan's range. Flop is three, deuce three. The guy have checks. Checks to the razors, see if Jonathan continues. He does. Thank you. 550. It'll be pretty hard for a guy have to think Jonathan caught a piece of this. If he was best pre-flop, he's probably still best now. He calls. The turn brings the ten of hearts. No one picks up any additional outs. A guy have checks. Looks like Jonathan is thinking about barreling again. He does. Betting 1,400. And looks like a guy of his really sticking to his read. If he calls here, he'd better be prepared to call the river too. More than 5,000 in the middle. Six on the river. What if Duhamel does barrel the river? That makes it easier for a guy to call. I don't mind Jonathan's barreling. It's just that people tend to call you down when you're short stack. It's a mental thing. 33.50. 33.50. He empties the clip. 33.50. Even though a guy have improved, this would be a pretty sick call down. Jonathan raised pre-flop and fired on every street. This is just one of those hands where if there's a call, one of these guys is going to end up feeling like a dope. A guy have does call. Jonathan Exposa Mux. A guy have won that hand by just planting his feet, gritting his teeth, and weathering the storm. Duhamel lost about half his stack there. He's now playing just 5,000. That hand brought to you by WCLS, the calling station. Back out into the field and back to Vicky Corrin's table. She's bet 2,700 on the turn. The board reads 9-3 deuce king with two clubs. Decision is on Babak Malakain. And the Swede raises to 6,000. And then Italy's Daniela Giudetti shoves for more than 15K. Really? I mean, really? Vicky's got some kind of decision. A pair and a flush draw would elicit this sort of response. I don't know that I waste my life playing poker to fold this hand. I mean, seriously. One or two pair of hands with no draws are an easy fold. 
has like 15,000 or something. 15,475. Nope, can't do it. I did not come all this way to fold this hand. You got me. She puts all her chips in. She's barely got you daddy covered. Decision now back on Malachine. 10 5 for call. She does not have Malachine covered. And unless he's got a set or a pair in the nut flush draw, this should be an easy fold. Giudetti knows he's been called in one spot. But not two. If you've got a set, you're winning. Right, he does have a set, a set of threes. Vicky with top two and a club draw doesn't get there yes. on the river. Pleased with it, are you? <laughs> Nice hand. Italians are very passionate people. I can still win the tournament. Yeah, you know that old saying, all you need is a few chips and a seat at the table. I can't speak Italian, but I'm pretty sure I know what he's talking about. He's literally phoning his mum with the news. He's Italian, you mean his roommate. You know that he's funny. Yeah, you tell him. Love the British solidarity there. Back to the feature table. The short stack Jonathan Duhamel has sixes in the hijack. He's raising to 450. Duhamel looks like he might be coming unglued over there. Pocket jacks for Max Leekov on the button. I think you've got to re-raise Jonathan with jacks in this spot. That is a three bet, 1,200 total. The blinds get out the way, it's back on Duhamel. I don't think Maxim's gonna be three betting Jonathan Lake too often here, especially since he knows Jonathan's likely to four bet him pretty wide. He four bet shoves, leak off snap calls. I think this is just a frustration shove from Jonathan. Duhamel in really bad shape. Leekov an 80% favorite to eliminate the 2010 World Series champion. I don't know if losing here is going to make Jonathan feel better or worse. Duhamel needs a six or running cards for a straight. Honestly, it can't get much worse than bubbling 300,000 euros in the super high roller yesterday. And now he's drawing dead. That jack was just insult to injury. Look, guys. Maybe Max has done Jonathan a favor by letting him get this trip to Monaco behind him. And that just says it all. Second day in a row he's had to do that walk of shame. After the couple of days he's had, someone should make sure he gets back to his room okay. On the secondary feature table, Tom Marchese has four bet. Over the top of a Salvatore Bianco three bet. The original Razor got out of the way. Decisions now on Bianco, and he folds. Tom Marchese looking healthy again after being all in just a short while ago. All that French rap music he's been listening to must be motivating him. I don't know, if I had to take a guess at Tom Marchese's playlist, I'd say, Richard Clayderman. Meanwhile, back in the uh, world of Vicky Corrin. Was he in? I think he has. <laughs> Very nice hand. All right. She's all in and all out. I didn't have nothing. No, not bad. It wasn't him. It wasn't even him. Good luck, all. Don't forget to have fun. Try not to shriek too loudly when you know someone else. Well, Vicky got the last word, and that's the real win, isn't it? Enchanté. No, it isn't. 1.5 million is the real win. And sorry, Vicky, but nothing's free in this town. So we've lost Vicky Curran, but ladies doing well in the tournament include Annette Oberstad, currently playing 61,000. She's in the top 10 at the moment. Speaking of 10s, Anna Marquez, Hachi Machi. Also high up the leaderboard with a stack of 58,000. Both Anna and Annette have leapfrogged Justin Bonomo. He's dropped out of the top 10. At least he's still in the tournament. Can't say the same for Vicky Corrin. I won the heads up side event yesterday, so I'm quite happy about that. Obviously not delighted to have gone out of the main event in a couple of levels, but uh, it's a good trip so far. I mean, how many events can you win in one trip? I mean, part of it might be because, you know, I won the tournament last night at about two in the morning. Didn't have very much sleep, woke up, I won't say I was in the wrong frame of mind. I think I played fine. I think most people will get their chips in with the hand I had. But uh, it's possible that over the nine hours, I might have started to crumble. So maybe it's better. I'll go and get a good night's sleep for another side event tomorrow. Vicky's play was just fine. I happen to believe that in this case, but I'd say it anyways, just so she doesn't write another newspaper article about me. 
She's actually probably the best player I've ever seen. Gorgeous, too. And brilliant. Just brilliant. Back to the feature table. Action has been folded around to Max Likov. Pocket tens in the hijack. And he raises. Makes it 450. 8 9 suited for Emin Agaev. This hand's all right in late ish position. He three bets to 1250. And ace king for Richard Lindaker. Last time Lindaker re raised with ace king off, he ended up having to fold it to a four bet. This time he'd be the one four betting. Even though a few of the pros in the what would you do suggested flat calling with ace king, Leekoff's been pretty aggro. 2875. He does four bet. 2875. Both blinds fold. Back on Leekov. Gonna be hard for Max to tell if this is a legit hand or just a really great spot for a re-steal. Oh. Looks like he's gonna get the information he wants with another raise. Five bet alert. 5,475. Easy decision for a guy of. Insta fold. Last time Lindaker folded to Faraz, who's a much looser player than Leekoff. All in. Wow, he shoves with the Ace King. Looks like he did not want to fold Ace King again. I think it's more of a fold to Max than it is to Faraz, but Leekoff has been playing pretty loose all day, so this is kind of a cooler. You might think Max doesn't have to call here, but if he were gonna fold, he should have done it before the five bet. I call. He calls. Yeah. And we have a race on our hands. Yep, just your standard 300 big blind race. Lindaker, the player at risk, and the player who is behind. This is a massive number of chips for this stage in the tournament. The flop has an ace on it, but a 10 as well. Leak up with trips. Looking pretty good for two tens. Lindaker might as well be racing against Usain Bolt. The turn card gives him a little bit of hope. So you're saying there's a chance. Lindaker needs a jack. He has four outs, but it's a six. Lindaker picked a bad week to quit folding Ace King. Oh, that's right. 57,300 chips slide across to Max Leekov. And in case anyone in the room didn't know, Richard Lindaker eliminated. What that screen doesn't tell you is that Max Leekov is now among the tournament chip leaders and joining him in the top 10 are fellow team pros Anna Marquez, Nacho Barbero, Johnny Lodden, and Max Martinez. But Martin Finger is the man out in front right now. Next time, Day 1B continues. And headlining the feature table, the one and only Daniel Negreanu. I told you for sure I win. <laughs> I haven't won an APT yet, so for me, winning any APT would be great, but winning the grand final would be just that much better. But the field is stacked with talent from all over the world, and at this stage, the title is anyone's for the taking.